Welcome to episode 45 of The Liz McMullen Show. I am welcoming back the most excellent guest, Mary Vermillion. Welcome to the show. Hi, Liz. Glad to be back. <laughs> oh, I love having extra time with awesome people. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. <laughs> You're good for my ego, Liz. Yeah, but not in an Eddie Haskell way, I hope. <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> So we are going to be talking about your series with the curious Mara. Right. Who's always getting in a pickle. <laughs> yes, she is. <laughs> Which is interesting. I don't know if you've read Jesse Chandler's series, um, The Shao Hanlon Capers. She's super high on my want to read list. Totally do it. Um, also I have a book giveaway. You probably can, you know, I'll tell you more about it off air. Uh, but you get the entire series if you come up with an interesting answer. Um, the reason why I bring up Jesse's series is that her series is, is very absurd. <laughs> you know, it's just so unbelievable and, you know, it's very interesting and quirky and hyperbolic and entertaining. Um, but what you have to kind of suspend this belief with is that she can keep on getting into these, these you know, obscene little m- mysteries and stuff where she's trying to, you know, help out. And Mara is the a much more, I wouldn't say sedate, but I'd say, you know, I have to suspend disbelief less with Mara. <laughs> Be- and I'm happy about that because, you know, sometimes it's a hard sell because you... you you did a panel uh, with other mystery, uh, murder mystery writers, and you said one of the things that you couch yourself in is the town, which is Iowa City. Mm-hmm. So I, I, when I was, before I read it, I was like, how on, on earth is she going to manage to have more than one murder mystery in a small town? <laughs> so that's tricky. Yeah, yeah. I, it seems like sometimes when I'm on panels with uh, with writers who do uh, police procedurals or or um, detective novels, they're they're always like it's the Jessica Fletcher syndrome. You know, everyone's fleeing from this person who has from the citizen who has people dying around her. But um, I think actually Iowa City has a few murders every year, so. <laughs> It's semi believable. Hopefully, you're not responsible for any of them. <laughs> well, would I admit it if I were? You could be being ironic. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I, I love the idea of someone who's not a professional solving crime. I've always loved the amateur detective. Yeah, I, I think what I find interesting about your series is she, she's a, a radio. Um, She's a radio host kind of thing. <laughs> what I thought was really funny when I read the first one is like she has a reading series where she interviews authors who... Oh, like you, Liz. <laughs> yes, like me. <laughs> so I was, you know, I was reading, I was just like, wait, hold on a second. What I found interesting was that you have Mara who she's she's a part of the media per se but she's not exactly what you would consider a journalist and um but she's she's manages to she's got a lot of guts this girl well thanks I hope so I don't think I would I would be putting my my nose in in that kind of drama <laughs> it's like I, I, I just, I'm not good. I'm not good at at being confrontational. I guess. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can protect my friends, or you know, you know, be you know, step away from my friend or whatever. But I can't imagine myself going up to all these different types of strangers and thinking of ways to interrogate them without them realizing that they're being interrogated. I was like. I can't, I, I can't picture myself as Mara, but I find her fascinating and, and probably infuriating to have as a girlfriend. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. She's, she's not an ideal girlfriend. No, especially since she has a major torch for Anne. Yes, yes, she does. One of the world's biggest torches. 
I, I find. It's sad, and it's sad that her boss, Orchid, is now, now Anne's partner. I know. It just doesn't... It was very unexpected, and the way that she found out about it was when she was trying to contact her boss, and her boss had, an, on the outgoing message, uh, you know, Orchid and Anne. She's like, it doesn't have to be my, my Anne. I mean, that's a common name. Oh, oh Yeah. <laughs> I had forgotten that's how she found out. <laughs> See, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> Thank you. <Ms. laughs> that first book was a, was a was a while ago, but I think you know Mara is so um, she's so stubborn when it comes to wanting to know the truth that I think it's that same sort of perseverance or perseveration, if you want to call it, that kind of keeps her keeps her attached to Anne. Mm-hmm. Well. The other, the other thing that happens is you can romanticize an ex when you're not dealing with the daily things that makes uh, your relationship difficult or whatever led to the breakup. Mm-hmm. You can, when you're pining for somebody, it's very easy because they're, you know, it's an illusion in a lot of ways. Yeah. And so she can continue to pine for Anne, even though Anne may just not be the person who's going to give her happiness. Right, right. So your first book was called Murder Was Death by Discount. Right. And and it did not happen um, at a sale for Christmas or anything like that. No, no. There's not somebody stabbing one person. That's my impersonal gift that I was going to give to someone. That's right. No fight over Beanie Babies. It was a fight over over whether Walmart would come to, to Mara's hometown. And uh, her aunts who took her in when she was a teenager um, were anti-Walmart, also radio women. Um, and uh, one of them is murdered, you know, so that, that's what, what sets, her, um, sets her into investigation mode because she really wants to find out who killed her aunt. Um, so yeah, it's all about it's all about the, the the controversies surrounding Walmart coming to a small town. One of the the stickier situations that I think pops up in the premise of all three books is where Mara's put in the position not where she, just where she's trying to solve uh, a murder for one reason or another, but she's also put into a position where she has to interrogate um, people. Uh, let's say, you know, for Mara's aunt, she's asking people who are um, Zara's friends um, personal questions as if they are and could be, you know, the murderer. She's like, Mm -hmm. don't talk to my friends this way. You know, it would never be a friend. Mm -hmm. And you're like, "Uh, yeah, it has to be. And then in the next book is, you know, about um, murder by mascot, and the big is like, it couldn't be one of my players. You know, nobody I know could possibly do that. But can you investigate this, please? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then Seminole Murder, it couldn't possibly be these people because they're good and loving and wonderful. And each time you snooker your readers into thinking, no, that couldn't be them. Oh, well, that's good. That's good. You would hope that it would not be apparent. What I find fascinating about your books is that you, it, it's one interview after the other where Mara is talking to different folks as she's starting to hypothesize and trying to get people to tell the truth and she can recognize that one person is lying but she's not quite sure why and then as the book goes on like you figure out why somebody's being dishonest may not also mean that they're guilty of what she's thinking that they're guilty of. And the unfolding is important. And obviously I don't want to give any spoilers. Um, but I, I still get surprised at how I don't predict who the person is the murderer. So oh, that's good. I'm glad, I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you can't. Because I, I, I try, and I was like, okay, I'm listening to all, you know, obviously, like, I'm in Mara's back pocket, so to speak, and I'm going with her in all these different missions, and then there are, of course, the red herrings, right. where it must be this person, because they're a klepto, and a liar, and... <laughs> 
and and you know god is like trying to nail jello to the wall to like get her to be honest about something so she must be responsible but no yeah yeah that's a really fun challenge of writing mysteries of you know making the doer surprising yet inevitable so there's always that question of how many clues to plant are you are you um, an outliner or a pantster or a combination? Oh, uh, can you guess? <laughs> no, we don't know each other that well. I'm an outliner. I would hope so because I was really disappointed. I was I was interviewing an author, and I thought for sure she was a planner. I had pages of notes where I wanted to ask her to, you know, kind of reveal the craft and whatnot for my listeners and folks who are both listeners and aspiring authors, etc. And then she broke my heart by being a panster. Wow. Wow. I, w- I wish I could be a panster. I, I envy people who can just sit down and draft away. But I, I'm not that person. Well, considering you told me, you told me in, in an, uh, another episode that you'd outlined what you were going to tell your mother about your partner, uh-huh. I should have known. <laughs> yeah, you should have known. I don't, I'm not even a, a pantser in my own life. Although I have to say, in fairness to me, I do not outline every conversation that I'm going to have. Obviously, otherwise you'd be completely traumatized by being interviewed by me. (laughs) True. True that. True that. Because I drag you all over the place because I am tangential. Mm. I love being tangential when I'm talking, but I don't love it when I'm writing. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Um, Boy, I honestly don't know. I think... Well, what do you do when you're planning? Like, what well, I, I, I think about first of all, who would? Well, you know, the whole the, the kind of situation grows out of out of Mara and her life and of issues that she's interested in, and obviously issues I'm interested in. And then I think, you know, given this set of characters who could be killed over this issue? Mm -hmm. Uh, And then I, you know, I develop that character a little, and then I think, okay, who, who could feasibly do that, do the killing? And I, I come up with a killer and maybe four or five other suspects and I work on their backstories and, um, those red herrings, as you say, the other secrets that they have that, um, are not related to the killing or, or are tangentially related. It doesn't mean that they did the murder. Mm-hmm. And then I, then I just think about who, who do I want the reader to suspect first and then who, and then who, you know, so mm-hmm. that the reader sort of has waves of suspicion. Mm-hmm. And I think about where I want to plant clues, but, but that said, and then I you guess, have the, Oh shit moment when Mara's right about to solve the mystery. And she's like, Oh, crap. Right. She thinks she almost has it, and then she's wrong. So, you know, and I, I, that's not to say I don't change my outline, because I do. I think if you're an outliner, you have to be extra careful to keep um, open so that things just don't seem too, too controlled or boring. Mm-hmm. So certainly I change things as I go. And um, with my first novel, when I was done with a draft, I actually... I didn't change the killer, but I changed the killer's motives. Um, so, but I just, I need the security of having a plan before I start drafting. Mm-hmm. Well, so I, I don't know, is that, is that the kind of thing you were looking for? Well, you don't know. It, you're definitely, you're definitely on, on point because your, your creative process is different. Some, some folks, pansters and otherwise, think that outlining um, kind of kills the creative spirit or somehow. But I feel like you're creating the story, uh, the bare bones, the, you know, the backbone to it all. And that requires a lot of creative thought and, and, and mapping out what direction things will be going in. And it gives you not only a place to start, but a place to return to. Sometimes a tangent or a switch in the way that you're writing the story works, you know, if you go with it. 
And sometimes it doesn't. And I think it's easier to double back if you have this outline or these notes or these files to refer back to, to get back on track. Yeah, it is. It is. It does. It does help you keep track, especially if you're stopping and starting, you know, I, I teach. So sad to say, I don't write every day. Um, so it's nice to have, it's nice to have those notes to go, to go back to. But, you know, if they, if outlining did feel like it was killing my creativity, I would certainly stop it. I think everybody has to do what works for them. Yeah, I, I guess, well, it's easy to see a relationship that, let's say, somebody in high school, um, oh, my God, you have to do required reading over the summer? Like, how horrifying and rote, you know? Mm -hmm. Um but I, I think that there, everybody has their own different approach to being creative. And I think an outline is a good way to start. And there's some folks who um, outline to the point where they have like a 50-page outline. And when they write, it's like one plot point after the other. But I don't think it's less creative. I just think it's a different way to approach the pen, so to speak. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Uh, and... I have to say, outline is probably not the best word for me. I have little note cards. <laughs> little note cards with various scenes on them. And then that way I can shuffle them around if I need to. Mm -hmm. So, um, death by discount. Those nasty, evil Walmart folks. <laughs> what I thought was really difficult but that you did well is how you had folks that may be on the soapbox, but it didn't read like slightly fictionalized reality or, you know, a series of, you know, all the different awful ways that, you know, Walmart is ruining our country. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I, I'm no fan of Walmart, but I wanted, I wanted to sort of show the issue and its complexity. And so that's partly why right in the middle of that book, there's a, a town hall meeting about whether the the store should come and I I tried to give equal voice to both sides cuz I I understand that for for a lot of really small rural communities Walmart is a good thing for them I don't think for my hometown it was but um I was in West Virginia once and uh I was in a town where there was literally no place to work not a gas station, not a McDonald's, nothing. And, and so, of course, they're thrilled if they're getting a Walmart. Why wouldn't they be? Um, so I try to keep people like that in mind, too, when I was, when I was writing it. Well, I think for uh, Death by Discount, um, you start from a position where you, you know that you're going into a small town and you're introduced to the good aspects of a small town like friends and connections and um, but as the story goes on you learn more about Wal what Walmart is up to and what it would mean for the town but you also learn what the hell is going on with that town mm, true you true. know including you know a lot of empty storefronts um, a lot of uh, like she'll be in different places where you know, she's the only customer really in the diner or, you know, there's maybe one or two people in the um, hardware store. Or So it's easy to start with that swelling romantic notion of small, small towns, kind of like a former vice president hopeful. <laughs> yeah, nice small town there, you know. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, but you slowly get to see, like, this is not really cut and dried and even like it would be different if the town was flourishing in the way that a small town could yeah that you know all the different things that like made it unique and food with you know supersizing before supersizing was in vogue and all these you know wonderful lovely active church going folk but it's not romantic and it is difficult to find work and you know, Walmart is not necessarily going to be the answer to the prayers that people want, but it also isn't all evil, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. 
So let's talk about some interesting characters. Okay. And um, Stuart Peterson, the mayor, what kind of guy is he? Hmm. I think he's a guy that cares about his own reputation and about his son doing well. The, I think what one of the interesting elements that you built into the story was what happened when um, a big factory, a big business decided to leave town and what that meant to the folks that were left behind. Right, right. Oh, that's right. And Stuart had to Stuart had to finesse that so that it didn't look like his fault. <laughs> so again, you're probably more familiar with Stuart than I am. <laughs> well, but he he was not a character that I could certainly understand him, but I wasn't super sympathetic with him. He he wanted Walmart. He was hoping that it was going to turn into a reelection bid for him. Right, um, right. Yeah, so, you know, mostly caring about his own office more than the good of the town, so. For me, I grew up in, well, it's a small town because it's a mile square, but it, it's densely populated and across the Hudson from Manhattan, so mm-hmm. it's not like a folksy small town. But what I do know is Hoboken at first was a retreat from Manhattan. Where, you know, we're talking about the, the turn of the century, 1900s. Mm-hmm. And it had all sorts of things like um, vaudeville halls and and shopping and and this very affluent kind of thing going on. And then um, it was also a place where a lot of people started off, uh, you know, from Ellis Island. So there was a large uh, immigrant community, and there were also a lot of factories, a lot of big factories, which meant that you know, for the hundreds of people getting off the boat, there were opportunities and longshoremen and whatnot and then the 70s happened Mm -hmm. and um a lot of the factories one after the other were closing so there's no work so what was a thriving community started to get a little bit um a little darker you know less um less safe like there there are several streets that are named after presidents and when I was a kid in the 80s I wasn't allowed to go into any street by myself that was named after a president (laughs) Wow! yeah because those were the dangerous areas was near the ghetto was you know and in you know areas that used to be okay when there was the factories were open but when the factories were closed not so much and then in the late 80s um the uh, uh, Maxwell House closed, which was weird because my town always smelled like coffee mm. f- for like the longest, and that closed. And so it went from this like bustling place with a lot of different socioeconomic levels, opportunities, and then when um, when businesses started going abroad and closing down places here because they didn't want to pay for unions and whatnot, so they closed. So Hoboken got to be a little rough around the edges. And then in the early 80s, it was rediscovered um, by yuppies who turned Hoboken into a bedroom community where it's cheaper and you get more um, square footage in Hoboken, but you're still just a really short bus ride from Manhattan. Nice. So now, like, Maxwell House (laughs) has turned into a huge uh, condominium complex and you know, I mean, it's a very, very affluent community once again, but it also, did, and for the most part, it didn't have jobs there. People would, as I said, they would live there and work in the city. And then Wiley, who's a, a publisher, um, uh, made their home base there and some other folks too. So now they're actually jobs that exist in Hoboken themselves. But when I was reading um, about the small town, I was thinking about, like, what it means when the jobs go away, when yeah. all your life, you know, or generations were getting a job, you know, you just had to have the end, like, oh, yeah, my uncle is working here, and he helped me get a job, and then the jobs are gone. Yeah, yeah, I, I find it, well, sad and fascinating how that changes a place. So I kind of, I wanted to capture my own town, you know, before it totally faded away. Mm-hmm. 
So do you have um, folks in there, you know, very active church ladies Mm -hmm. um, cooking lots of casseroles and pies and whatnot when something goes awry? Mm Mm-hmm. I do. Those were... I I know several people like that, and especially when I was a child. So what kind of couple were Glad and Z together? Well, um... I think they were a really dedicated, loving couple, um, you know, because they, they started that radio station together. Um, Glad was definitely the, the butcher of the two, the more taciturn of the two. Mm-hmm. Um, Z, Z the, the, more, the more gregarious one, um, the, more, the more tactful one. Um, but, he, but I think they, they gave, Ma, they gave Mara a great example of a, of a loving relationship. What, what I liked about the community is, yes, they're a lesbian couple and the person who's been murdered is Glad, who's Z's partner, but there's so much love for the couple. And, and in addition to, you know, one of the reasons why they're so against Walmart, um, is because of how it's going to affect their friends. Mm-hmm. And so they're very active and 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 trying to promote and keep the town going, no matter how much it's limping along, including um, letting their advertisers pay whatever they could, you know, um, and doing their best to keep things together. I, I I like that small town aspect of it, and also created tension um, to the point where um, Z was was. Uh, attempted to kick uh, Mara off on her ass for interrogating her friends. Right, right, right. She did not. She did not want that happening. So protecting her friends from Walmart and from her own niece. <laughs> and then we find out who the killer is. And of course, you know, I guess one of the thing that brings the peril is like, how do I negotiate the social ties that? Um, folks who are suspects have to the person who Mara's trying to help. And, you know, how does she also get things done? I still can't believe she gets people to talk the way that she does. <laughs> Especially those those teenage boys. You know, where have you been? Oh, no. Yeah. Where do, where's your... I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, how is she, and, and like the, her, she's got, not exactly terrible taste in girlfriends, but like her love interests in, in all three books are, you know, not quite, you know, they're, it almost seems like they're more into like a booty call than actually loving and connecting with right. Mara. Right. And I think, you know, subconsciously, I think she picks people like that because she still she still has a thing for Anne. Because mm-hmm. you know, Neil in, in book one, Neil the cop, is you know pretty much married to her work, and um, well, the same is true really for Bridget in book two. Yeah, and they're gorgeous, and I think it's interesting because she feels not gorgeous and not exactly lovely, kind of geeky with, like, damn it, red hair. Yeah. Like, you know, and freckles, and, and you know, she's not exactly, you know, going to be on the cover of any magazines. So it's kind of fun that she has, like, hot chicks, you know, banging down her door and stuff. That's... Yeah, I think so, too. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. You know, with Bridget in uh, Death by Mas- Murder, My Mascot, um is a catch in some ways, but also, you know, I think both um, Bridget and Neil are emotionally unavailable. Yeah. Which is what she was accused of being uh, by Anne, who left her and then became the partner of Orchid. (laughs) (laughs) Who's worse than emotionally unavailable. But yeah, I hadn't thought about, I, I actually had not thought about that, Liz, that... Mara's accused of being emotionally unavailable, and then she chooses an emotionally unavailable girlfriend. Yes. Who occasionally get a little stiff um, and defensive of their unavailability and pointing to the direction of Anne as one of the reasons why their intimacy is not what it could be. Right, right. 
It's always somebody else's fault, isn't it? <laughs> Mary, it's your fault that I can't follow a, like a structure during an interview. It's totally your fault. <laughs> I am like, it's weird. I'm a panster interviewer, but I have lots of notes that I look at when I'm trying to figure out what the hell I'm doing. Um, I want to move, move on to the next uh, book, which is Murder by Mascot. And okay. God, that was gruesome. How, how, how our asshole of a guy who uh, manages to get killed, impaled, injured against a Hawkeye. Yeah. The Herky. Is, is that real? The mascots? Oh, yeah, completely real. Those, those Herkies. My imagination is not that good. <laughs> yeah, there was, this whole, there was this whole thing in Iowa City. The, the Hawkeye, the Herkies, is, is the University of Iowa's mascot. And they had this whole thing called Herky on Parade, where um, diff, it was cool, actually. Different artists did different, different Herkies like I have in the book. There was Marilyn Munn Herky, which I think that's the Herky where the... the the killing occurs yes but they're quite large i mean someone really could get killed if they were pushed pushed into one um in fact my partner and i were like i was trying to figure out how the murder would occur and so we were like by a herky and i was kind of like positioning myself around it kind of you know bonking on things and people were walking by giving me quite quite the looks <laughs> you're like a method actor <laughs> well i wanted to see if it would really be if i really thought it would be possible that someone could could die that way and i i, I truly think they could i am not a forensic expert but but they're but, also super tall so things that are that are possible for somebody who's over six foot will not be possible for a mini mara Right, right, right. So yeah, the the murder victim was really tall, a basketball player. So um, yeah, just a very a very odd murder, and I liked that. Well, Dave DeVoster, uh, mm -hmm. her evil rapist in the story. Um, this having having the the premise be about. Um, Dave uh, had raped a member of the women's basketball team, a Division One women's basketball team, mm -hmm. and it would you got to see how it's difficult to try and solve a murder when you know you have to deal with victims who've gone through what they've gone through. Right. Right. And Bridget, you know, had spoken beforehand to Mara, like, you know, in a, a more innocuous kind of way. And, and Mara tried to get the dirt from her, the skinny, and it didn't work. And then out of nowhere, Bridget shows up and is like, you know, help me out with this. Because basically she's trying to protect her players because she's, you know, one of the coaches. And uh, she wants her to find out um, who has done the murder to get her team off the hook. Uh, but you can't kind of pick and choose who the uh, potential suspects are. Right, right, because it's highly likely that, that one of her players was the, was the killer mm -hmm. because most of them are extremely distraught over what happened, of course. Mm -hmm. So can you give a little, um, a little summary of, of where we're at when we start the book Murder by Mascot? Yeah, where where we're at is um, literally Mara's at a, a basketball game with Ann and Orchid. Um, but what has happened is Dave DeVoster has has um, raped um, a woman on the on the Hawkeye basketball team, and uh, pretty much everyone in Iowa City knows that. And uh, he has uh, gotten off. Um, not only is he not convicted, but he, he is not, um, he doesn't even get kicked off the team. So, um, some people like Mara and her friends are infuriated and others who are die hard, um, men's basketball fans are, are not so troubled. What well, I just, just even the concept of being red shirted, which means that he couldn't play that year, but his senior year he'd be able to play. Mm hmm. The, the investment that um, 
Big Ten schools or schools where their athletic programs reign supreme and bring in a lot of money just bring so many ugly, um, horrifying sexual crimes that can happen, like with Rutgers and, and the coach that was molesting kids but didn't get called out on it immediately because they didn't want to have bad press. Right. And oh, Penn State, you mean. No, it was it was Rutgers, Rutgers University. Really? I think it was Rutgers, wasn't it? I'm I'm pretty sure the pedophile was was Penn State. I think Rutgers had that guy um, who was just really abusive to his players and um, was calling them homophobic names. Oh, okay. Now I'm, I'm mixing up my homophobe but, shit. No, but the point was instead of instead of going to the cops about walking in on a coach and a child being raped, mm-hmm. he didn't go to the cops. He went to his superiors. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's like, it's like they operate under a different set of laws than the rest of the rest of the world. And it's just it's so distressing. I mean, you know, the whole Kobe Bryant thing, um, which has been a while now, but, um, and, and, and the incident in my book is based on a real incident. I mean, there was no murder or anything, but, but, but the rest of it happened. Um, you know, in, 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 in Iowa, it's a, it's a, was a pretty well-known case. Um, so I just, I, that kind of, um, special treatment is just so, so disturbing. It's like, you know, protect the college at all costs and the reputation at all costs. And even Bridget uh, in the book was guilty of that. Um, Not wanting, like wanting any players that were queer to kind of be in the closet and under the radar. Bridget wanted to to find who the murderer was to get suspicion and whatnot off of her team. Right. Um. Even and any time when Mara got aggressive about it and asking people and you know calling them out on their dishonesty, um, one of the things that makes this book even stickier is that um, is that her beloved Mara Mara's Ann gets tied up in things and they think they she's been accused of being the murderer. Right, right, because she, Anne is, uh, Anne is in charge of the Women's Center, and she, and, um, she was leading a protest against, um, against the fact that Dave DeVoster wasn't, wasn't punished. Um, so yeah, and then that, so of course Mara's, Mara has all sorts of reasons for wanting to find out what really happened, because she knows that, that Anne couldn't have done it. Lexi Roth is a piece of work. Oh yeah, yeah. The journal, the the journalist, right? Who really wants? She's so smarmy. It's like she misuses people's words, and the reason why there's suspicion on Anne is because she keeps on trying to make it seem like uh, Lexi, her own actions and the things that she says and does, is somehow a part of. Uh, what Anne at the center is doing and um, misrepresenting what she's doing and saying, including, you know, Anne's protesting, you know, and has her signs up, but Lexi has a sign up that says castrate DeVoster. Oh, yeah, that's right. She's a... Uh... She's just like a mess, and 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 she's she's making for trouble, and she's got her own little secret going on, which I thought was fun. Yeah, you know, like, huh. and of course you have not just the the university uh, wanting to protect its players, in addition to being the golden boy um, on the basketball team, his father is very very wealthy, one of the wealthiest persons in the state, mm-hmm. and is accustomed to um, brushing things under the carpet. And what I thought was interesting because we don't get to know his family. 
but the way that you described um, his his uh, mother and sisters, um, how they kind of don't make eye contact, you can see how a monster like Devoster was made. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. So it's very sticky. We have the gorgeous Miss uh, Bridget, who who wants nothing but the best for her players, and everybody seems to be towing the party line. Shelley. Um, one thing I, 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 I was curious about with Shelly is, yes, she was a manager and she said that she was no longer going to, you know, be, um, making baskets or whatever, not because she was uh, not good enough to be on the team. I was like, what has to be going on in her head? Yeah. 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 I've often, I've often wondered what it, what it's like to go from being, a star high school athlete to a manager of a sports team. Um, so that's partly what drew me to that character. I mean, anytime anyone has to undergo a significant downgrade, which what a downgrade, a downgrade. Yeah. That's a better way of putting it. Um, how do they cope with that? So that's, that's what interested me about her character. She kept, I mean, and then as you learn what's going on, you find out that, her father was her coach. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, my God, and the hits just keep on coming. Yeah. I felt bad yeah. for her. But what? they're all so loyal. It's like it, it, it's almost like getting wound up in the school spirit, you know. I was like, right. I can't imagine what that must be like. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would take a lot of commitment. You just have to really love the team and the sport. And they, those girls were good at keeping their lips zipped. Yeah, they were. Which <laughs> made for more uh, trouble for uh, our intrepid journalist, Indeed. talk show host, to find out what the hell is going on here. Indeed. I love how church ladies show up in your books. <laughs> And how you can twist their love of Jesus, you know, to make them spill information. <laughs> or, or, you know, find out where the lies lie. I think that's more interesting, too. Like, you know, people say one thing, but is that really what they're trying to say? Or what are they dancing around you're trying to avoid and, and yeah. throwing suspicion here and there? Yeah. Yeah. Damn. I did not predict the end of that book, and folks, if you'd like to see some more of Mary Vermillion's trickery, you'll have to buy her books. <laughs> 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 and now we're on to um, something a little bit different, but also emotional. And um, that would be the third book in the series called Seminal Murder, which is kind of a gross title. <laughs> It was meant to be clever, not gross. <laughs> I'm teasing you. For your listeners, it's a murder that takes place in a sperm bank. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I think I think Rainbow Reader, when she did a review of me, I think she gave me some award for ballsiest title of a lesbian novel, something like that, <laughs> which is also pretty clever. But I'm bunch. <laughs> okay, it wasn't okay, folks. I, I, I'm, I've misled you. It's not nasty or gross. It's clever, but I'm. So, but still, I mean, we deal with a lot of semen in the story. Yes, it's true. It's true because there are are, are lots of characters trying to to get pregnant. Um, notably, Anne, um, Mars X, and uh, and then as I said, a murder takes place in a sperm bank. So. Um, and even before that murder takes place, Mara is uh, is doing a piece for uh, NPR on uh, her friend who who ultimately becomes the murder victim is uh, trying to raise money for an endowment to help low income women with fertility treatment. So Mara is doing a story on that. So she's already pretty embroiled in, in learning about how artificial or assisted uh, and um, reproduction works. So, Assisted you know, reproduction. Of, That's a very nice way of putting it. <laughs> one of the, I think one of the epigraphs is every, every sperm is sacred, every sperm is great. <laughs> so. 
<laughs> Wait, what wasn't that like um, Monty Python? It was indeed. <laughs> A song, <laughs> a great song. Ah, every secret. Um, so you have a? Can you read uh, from this particular sure. your latest novel? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, what I'll read is, is sort of from the middle, and uh, as I said, the director of the of the fertility lab is murdered. She's a good friend of Mara's, so Mara is trying to find her killer. Mm-hmm. And uh, and Anne Anne has been using that lab, and uh, right before the the scene that I'll read, um, Mara's out investigating with her housemate Vince, and um, Mara gets a frantic phone call from Anne, just begging her to drop everything and come over, and that's where this this scene starts. Oh, okay. I'm like, oh, I remember. Go along. <laughs> <laughs> an okay scene for me to yes no that's fine oh go ahead i opened ann's front door without knocking and rushed to the chair where she was curled up clutching the phone in both hands labras her golden retriever stood guard beside her whimpering when the dog saw me she barked and wagged her tail but she didn't come greet me as usual she never leaves the side of a hurting human i'm here i said softly Anne didn't budge, so I squatted next to her in Labras. She still didn't acknowledge me, so I gently took the phone from her and held her hands in mine. Slowly, she looked up, her face raw and red. Without her glasses, she seemed exposed, incomplete. I asked her what happened, and her lower lip trembled as she tried to speak. I couldn't take much more. My pulse skittered crazily. I squeezed her hands. She pulled away and straightened herself in the chair. She reached for her glasses on the end table and slipped them on before she spoke. My period started. What? I thought someone was dead. Anne went glacier. I should have known you wouldn't understand. Me? You're the one who doesn't get it. I was investigating Grace's murder. I stopped what I was doing to come help you. You terrified me. Then you criticized my reaction? Labras barked. Anne dabbed beneath her glasses with a Kleenex. I should have been nicer. I knew what the start of a period meant to Anne. Another round of trying and hoping, wanting and waiting. But seriously, was she this distraught every month? I used our donor's last vial, she said. Orchid wants us to take a break before we choose another one. How long, I asked. Anne's face tightened. Again, I'd said the wrong thing. She's been waiting for an excuse to get me to stop trying. First, she says she doesn't like what it's doing to me. Then it's too stressful for her. Now she says we need to find another lab because the university isn't safe. Anne yanked another Kleenex out of the box beside her. Orchid thinks one lab is as good as another, but I've bonded with the staff at this lab. She squeezed the Kleenex until it vanished in her fist. I can't deal with finding a new donor and a new lab. Labrys rested her head on Anne's lap and whimpered again. I tried to think of something to say. Orchid doesn't get it, Anne said. Outside, a car with a muffler growled past and the wind buffeted bare trees. Anne chewed on the inside of her lip. I think this may break us up, she said quietly. I'm ashamed to admit it, but I felt a jolt of elation. Then I saw a tear rolling down Anne's cheek. I wiped it away without thinking. She gazed at me, her eyes filled with pain and confusion. Annabelle, I said, using her nickname of old. She looked away. I didn't want to say anything good about Orchid, but I knew I should. I was Anne's friend, and friends help each other through relationship troubles. Orchid worships you, I said. Anne turned it back toward me. She'd do anything to make you happy, I added. That's not good enough, Anne said. Don't you see? I didn't, not the least little bit. I don't want Orchid to do this for me, Anne said. I want her to want a baby, our child, as much as I do. Oh, Annabelle, I thought. Nobody can meet that desire. I sat on the floor and stretched my legs in front of me. One of them had fallen asleep as I'd crouched next to Anne. I must be doing something wrong. She blew her nose. Do you know how much money I cost us every month? 
She pulled her knees toward her chest and hugged them. I don't know what else to do. I've tried ovulation predictor kits, taking my basal body temperature, checking my cervical mucus. Whoa, I thought, too much information. I've tried extra massages and affirmations and continued new visualizations. She paused and bit her lip. I have even tried Clomid, a fertility drug. Anne didn't believe in drugs, not even Advil or cough drops. I thought hard before I spoke. That must have been a tough decision. It's been a waste. Anne tucked her hair behind her ear, and I saw that she was wearing the gold heart-shaped earrings I'd given her our first Christmas together. I'd kissed each ear after she put them in. My throat tightened at the memory, and I forced myself back to the present. Tell me about the donor, I said. I want to know what he was like. It felt strange to use past tense on a guy who was probably alive and well, but he was gone from Anne's world, and that's what mattered. She gave me a quizzical look, then a hesitant smile. You want to see his profile? Jump ahead just a little. Sure. When Anne returned to the kitchen, she'd washed her face, combed her hair, and donned a sweater. She handed me one, too, explaining that she and Orchid hadn't turned the heat on yet. My hair crackled with electricity as I pulled the bulky cable knit over my head. Anne set a manila file folder on the table next to me and sipped her tea. Tell me about him first, I said. Anne sighed. He was perfect. We both thought so. I couldn't imagine Orchid using the words perfect and man in the same sentence. No, really, Anne insisted. Orchid read the profiles before I did, and she said there was one she thought was perfect and that I'd know it when I saw it. She was right. We didn't have to negotiate or anything. Anne's face clouded. The only problem was the limited supply, but I told myself I'd get pregnant long before it, it ran out. She shook her head. Stupid. I didn't want her to beat herself up again. What did you like about him? He had Orchid's coloring. She opened the folder. Look at his baby picture. There, sitting on the beach next to a sand castle, was a blue-eyed toddler with dark hair. He held a seashell toward the camera. Doesn't his energy seem great, Anne said, creative and in tune with nature. What I noticed about the lad was his wiriness, not a trait you'd associate with Orchid. Several women who purchased his sperm have reported pregnancies, Anne said. You can't buy it if you live in San Francisco or L.A., that meant his little guys had generated so many children in those cities that the sperm bank was worried about half-siblings accidentally hooking up. He graduated summa cum laude from Berkeley, Anne said, and now he's a civil rights attorney. Impressive, I said. He's also a vegetarian Unitarian who practices mindfulness meditation and supports the Green Party. I'm no scientist. But I'm pretty sure you can't inherit things like dietary habits and political affiliation. What about his parents and grandparents, I asked. That's the best part. His mom is a lesbian, and that's why he wanted to be a donor. Here, she flipped to the last page. Read his essay. The essay consisted of short answers to four questions, a sort of Baltimore catechism for sperm shoppers. Anne pointed to his third answer. My mother and father taught me everything I know about love, respect, and courage. Mom is a lesbian who came out late in life, but women who come out early also deserve the opportunity to build families. I do this to honor my beautiful mother. Okay, that made me want his sperm. According to Grace, a lot of donors just want extra cash for med school. That or they worship their own genes. Too bad we can't breed out arrogance, she'd said. Well, Anne asked. I proclaimed him perfect and tried to think of a tactful way to phrase my condolences. I'm sorry that his sperm is gone. I'm sorry you won't be able to use him. Where was the Hallmark card for this situation? Look at the rest, Anne said. I was glad to oblige. I'd studied plenty of short profiles online preparing for my radio series, but I hadn't seen many long ones, and I was happy that Anne was sharing something important with me. As Anne filled a soup pot with water and removed vegetables from the fridge, I read about Donor 1763. 
His Myers-Briggs type was ENTJ. He spoke four languages, including Japanese, and played three musical instruments. His favorite color was blue. His favorite animal, the tiger. His favorite movie, Casablanca. It didn't ask about his favorite book. A right-handed gentleman, he had no tattoos, piercings, or military service. And of course, no health problems or vices except for drinking four ounces of alcohol per week. Presumably, he enjoyed measuring almost as much at the, as the folks at the sperm bank. In inches, they listed the measurements of donor 1763's neck, chest, inseam, waist, sleeve, wrist, shoe size, and hat size. You could know your sperm donor better than your partner, better than yourself. What was the circumference of my wrist? How many years of piano lessons had I endured? It's a lot to take in, isn't it, Anne said. I nodded. She was chopping a carrot, her cutting board surrounded by an army of vegetables, broccoli, onions, celery, and something I didn't recognize. The rhythm of her chopping soothed me, and the scent of cooking rice made me think of lazy Sunday afternoons when she'd make huge batches of soup and we'd make love while it simmered. I turned my attention back to the profile. After the donor's information, you got the skinny on his father, mother, siblings, aunts, uncles, and grandparents all college-educated and multilingual, except for an underachieving aunt, all musically or athletically talented, all healthy and long-lived. That last part was par for the course with sperm donors, but call me cynical. Isn't so much good luck bound to run out sooner or later? This is a tough, tough situation. <sighs> A, what do you know what to say or not, but it's kind of creepy to try and design humans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like, I get it. I get why you want to have this kind of, like, folks, prospective parents who are choosing um, sperm donors. Mm-hmm. But it's just so creepy. I was like, would you have been cast in the role of the partner of the woman that you're with? <laughs> 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 Would you have made the paper chase cut? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, those are those are high standards. I think it's something less than 1% of, of men who apply to be sperm donors get picked. It's just so obscene, and it's funny how when I was younger, there was this big to-do about the human genome, and, and what if they found out the gene that makes somebody gay? Mm, um, yeah. And they would have the option of aborting the child if they were going to be gay or have something else, like, you know, some kind of disability or birth defect and whatever other uh, non PCs ways of referring to it, but creating the perfect child. Yeah. There's a lot of pressure for that. There's a lot of pressure on the parents, it's, there's a lot of pressure on the children once they're born. Mm -hmm. and it's like the level of very in-depth expectations it's it's got to be weighing heavily on these kids and parents you know i have to be the perfect parent you know lesbians we have to work hard to be able to have kids you know so we better be the best that you can possibly be because it's something we've chosen to do yeah yeah i hadn't thought about that but i suppose that is where part of the part of the pressure comes from I mean, I, I can, you know, it's just, there's another element that just, I remembered by If These Walls Could Talk too with Ellen DeGeneres um, and Sharon Stone as a couple trying to have a child. And one of the difficulties they were having a discussion about is like, why can't we make a child out of love? Why can't, oops, you know, we got pregnant. It's not something that can happen for a gay couple. It has to be very intentional. And the landmines that you go through and not wanting to use somebody that you know for more than one reason, including hazy custody issues and all the stuff that's involved and just having a chance to have what many um, straight couples take for granted. Right, right. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really in awe of my many friends who... Um, you know, work so hard to use assisted reproduction or to, to adopt children. Cause it just, it seems like sometimes it can just be so, so much agonizing waiting. And 
I feel I feel lucky sometimes that I'm the sort that just never wanted to have children. Well, I mean, I it when it comes to adoption or other forms of trying to make a family, it's like getting interviewed for another job. Right. Right. <laughs> that you have to justify yourself and show your home and the room that the child would have and all these other elements. It's like, you know, proving your right to have something that is, I mean, not that there, there are plenty of heterosexual couples that have difficulty conceiving or, you know, choose to adopt rather than um, uh, making a child themselves for many reasons. But to have to fight so hard just to have the right to try Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, I had thought about it, but it's, instead of the, the, the sperm donor being under scrutiny, it's the prospective parents under scrutiny in the case of adoption. Yeah. Yeah, it's intense, you know, and, and even though I made fun of the title of your book. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. We're, what? Yeah, it's okay. But I mean, it's a very intense uh, investigation, and one of the elements that is in it, of course, there are folks who, um, the in the book itself, there were evangelical Christians who were talking about how sperm banks cheapen and is like a, a form of prostitution for men, and and that you know it 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 robs a child of their opportunity to ha know their father and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And I won't give the spoiler, but it's very interesting. Uh, Leo Spires, what is really probably one of the things that's got a fire under his ass over this is something a little bit beyond assisted um, um, reproductive reproduction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 But I, I put that character in the novel just because you know, I find it. I find it so troubling that um, folks who think they can control or should be able to control other people's families. You mm -hmm. know, and it, again, they are mostly the um, uber right wing nasties. <laughs> and um, the, and also and the and that's what, what it's also you know the big ass capitalists um, stealing money and crumbs from the mouths of of. of of uh, church ladies and people who put their their every last essence into being a part of a church, and there are these guys who have like money coming in by the thousands and millions, and right, right, just the financial corruption too. Um, I think I can't remember who it was. Of course, I'm not going to remember the details because that's just how I roll. But there was this there was this very um, successful minister. Uh, who was gathering millions and millions of dollars um, from his fo followers via, uh, you know, his television show, saying that, you know, we're in Africa and we are building schools and we're building sustainable farms and this is where your money is going. And in reality, it was not going to those things. Those flights were carrying equipment to get diamonds out of, um, like, you know, I guess, I, I can't think of the type of machinery it was, but it's basically, he was using it for his own bottom line and using money that people had donated to help the poor and impoverished and struggling so that he could actually uh, get equipment to mine more diamonds. Wow. Wow. I haven't, I haven't heard of that story. Oh, it's not special. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually, you know, it's strange and you'll have to read the book to find out, but I, I end up liking Leo a little bit more when I understand some of the things that he's up to. He's not, he's, I think that's important when you create villains or unsavory characters in your books is that they can't, be all doom and gloom you know they can't ha they have to have even if they're not truly redeemable qualities they have to have something about the way that they are that makes them human yeah well I I, I was trying really hard to do that with Leo Spire's character to um 
I mean, it started with my own question of what makes people like that tick. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure not, not all of the haters um, have reasons like he does for what he does. Um, but it was, it was interesting to, to ponder him. But, I, you know, I think somebody like Fred Phelps, who you can probably guess partly inspired this character, you know, I, I'm not... I'm not sure he really has reasons for what he does, but who knows? I'm no expert on Fred Phelps. I'm no expert on all of this stuff. <laughs> but I, you know, I think I, I like the way, um, cause I'm going to draw this in cause our, our time together has come to a close. Okay. Um, I, I like the way you sustain the mystery throughout your books because you know she's un- uncovering stuff here and there but it's uneven it's almost like a form of archaeology and it's not all apparent how things work together and you do it in a way that seems plausible and that keeps the reader turning the pages um rather than you know just one wrong turn there's a labyrinth of different directions that Mara has to go in in order to eventually discover and unfortunately be in the company of the murderer as you know she finishes her final little hypotheses so i i like the journey i think you do it well and i also i i feel like you know there's would it be correct to say like a midwestern sensibility um to it all i i like the way it flows oh well thanks i'm i'm a midwestern girl so that's not surprising <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah i actually you know i heard npr earlier today and i thought of you uh-huh. that makes me happy i love npr <laughs> i know npr shows up in 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 uh, seminal murder yes it does it does so i want to thank you uh for taking this uncharted meandering outline free um interview <laughs> well it was my delight you you are such a great reader. You have helped me see my own books in new ways, Liz. Oh, gosh. Oh, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Well, thank you.